We're uh, moving on now to uh, Mr. Dog. Um, Rain Dog is a guy I met on Retro Row so long ago, they didn't call it Retro Row yet. Um, he's... Row. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, so, so I met him and I, I found out he's a poet. He's a writer. And he, uh, he had also started publishing other poets. And I, I just think this is so important that we have somebody in our community that has, has helped to create the legacy for all of these people, not just uh, the little chapbooks that he publishes, with so much attention and, and painstakingly put together, and for real books. I mean, these have ISBN numbers. These aren't just like things that he staples in his, in his you know, den. These are real books. And he's also published anthologies of poetry by other writers, and a, a book that is near and dear to my heart, the work of Scott Wanberg, who is somebody that I had the pleasure and experience of writing of reading with. Um, he uh, says that RD stands for Rain Dog, but honestly, I think RD actually stands for the real deal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rain Dog. How's everybody doing tonight? I have to say, this is a big crowd. I'm probably going to get nervous now. So I'm used to reading to like five or six people, you know. It's just the luck of the draw. But uh, I've enjoyed some success with my, uh, this is my latest project, the Lummox Poetry Anthology. This is number six. Uh, working on number seven, starting up uh, in April of this year. And um, I'm, you know, it's kind of coming together, sort of. Uh, I've been doing this since nah, since uh, 1994, and I started writing in, again in 1993, so I had a brief stint of like really cool poetry and stuff happening, and then I, uh, then I kind of, uh, somebody told me that uh, if you want to be considered as a legitimate publishing house, you have to publish other people. I think it was Gerald Lachlan who told me this, and it was, at the time, I thought, oh, well, of course, that makes sense, sure. And, and then later on in life, I thought, you know what, that Jerry Lachlan must have had it in for me because this is really a lot of work. <laughs> but uh, I had this whole thing prepared for tonight, and then my computer crashed. And uh, so I'm going to kind of basically sort of uh, be freewheeling it uh, for the most part. Uh, let me give you the, the pertinent information first. Uh, Lummox Press is the little outfit that I run. It's a small press operation. Small press is defined as uh, books that are that maximum amount of uh, uh, copies published in a print run is like a thousand. In my world, I publish on demand, so uh, a book that's considered a bestseller is a book that sells a hundred copies. Sad as that is, but that's the way it goes. You got to work with what you got. Uh, Stevens' uh, process is kind of like mid-range, I think, mid-level. And, and where I'm at is kind of like down around the first rung, so, which is okay. You know, there's a lot of people that write poetry, and they're not all, you know, uh, Billy Collins. I mean, they're, they're people like you and me. In fact, there's probably, how many people in this room have written a poem? Yeah, look at that. See? Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and I probably, I probably, um, you know, passed on all of your poems at one point from, <laughs> along the way. I mean, I, I do have a uh, kind of a standard of, of what I will publish, and uh, basically, for me, it's got to be a, it's either going to be an aha moment, where I, I have like a, like a vision of clarity that happens after reading a poem. And I get a lot of aha moments lately, so uh, I'm, I'm happy that that's kind of the realm that I'm moving into. And the other one is kind of a, uh, a goosebump effect, where you read something and it just kind of makes you go, oh, man, ooh. You know, and, and, I, I, and I'm happy to say that I, I get a lot of people that sim submit me ooh poetry as well. And so I'm pretty happy in that regard. I mean, this book is, uh, here, here's all the people in the book on the back here. This one's a small issue. It's only got 156 poets in it. 
normally they're averaging around 170 or thereabouts. You know, I get poetry from people all over the world, um, all over America. Um, I, if I'm lucky, maybe I could squeeze a couple of poems out of Long Beach, but so far, people tend to look at me and think, oh, he's an international publisher. He's not going to be interested in my stuff, which is just makes me, you know, I have a similar reaction to that when I, when the president uh, sends out a tweet, you know, it's just like, <laughs> what the heck? Who's hissing me? No, not you, president. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got my, uh, got my tr beautiful Trump shirt that was designed by Gary Jacoboli right here in the front. <laughs> who I just, I just had the pleasure of publishing uh, at the end of last year, right? It all kind of blends together after a while. So I started, um, I started writing poetry and I started getting involved with the local poetry scene. I was totally unaware that there was a, such a thing as a local poetry scene because I hadn't written anything for 10 years. And um, so I started kind of getting into the LA scene and trying to find a niche that I could work out of and unfortunately, that never happened, but that's probably a good thing because I would have just been hanging out with a bunch of guys that all thought the same as me, and you know that's just not very inspiring. You need you need friction, and um, to get some pocket money, I decided what I would do is I would I would uh, publish a little uh, uh, a monthly digest, a literary arts digest, which I did for eight years every month. Rain or shine, I didn't have much of a social life at that time, so, you know, I, I could do it. And, um, and then I started publishing a little, a little chapbook series that's about a quarter size of a page called the Little Red Book Series. And that's where I started publishing other poets from around the country. I published a couple of books by Mr. Lachlan, since I figured, you know, he'd want me to, you know, give him the tip of the hat since he told me what I had to do. Um, and then I and then I and then I slowly expanded outwards, and I actually published a couple of books by people that were not in the United States, which was interesting. The books are so small that it's okay. I mean, it's you can actually send copies to somebody and not spend an arm and a leg. Not like now, where I send this to like Canada, it cost me twenty bucks just to send just for postage, you know. And uh, if you, well, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So. Um, I was an active poet for the first 15 years. I've been doing this for almost 25 now. The um, last 10 years or so, I've been, my poetry writing has been dwindling down to where I think I'm in a two year writer's block right now, but I still have the poetry. So I'm still actually, I feel like I'm publishing poetry. It's almost like you're writing poetry. It just has somebody else's name on it, you know? So it's, it's kind of an odd position to be in, uh, but I think you, if you're dedicated to your craft, then you'll want to you know, do a good job, even if you're not an active participant, which is kind of, you know, people talk, oh, you're the poet rain dog. And I'm like, mm, well, kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that something's going to happen that's going to like uncork the dam so I can start writing again, because uh, I miss it. I get jealous of the people that I publish, you know, because their poetry is so well written. I think, oh man, you're you're such a you're like a caveman, you know. You write with a club. What's wrong with you? You should be working for Breitbart or something. So, um, you get a letter of recommendation. I I'm gonna see if I could do that. So uh, when I talked to Steve about doing this uh, this thing tonight, I. You know, I, I really agonized over what I would say. Like, you know, I gotta come up with a speech, I gotta blah, 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 blah. And then my computer crashed and I realized, well, it's just gonna be whatever you can come up with off the top of your head, because that's basically all you ever do anyway. Um, <laughs> hey, if you've, got a, if you've got a strong suit, wear it. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a poem from, that start, was started in 1984 and was finished, at least I think it was finished, Three days ago. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's about the process 
Um, I spent a lot of years uh, embroiled in the humanist movement. And um, at the time, I thought, this is it, man. This is the be all, end all. Yeah. I make, everything makes total sense to me now. I can see it all. It's crystal clear. And then, you know, um, the 90s happened. And <laughs> yeah. So I. Um, this actually came from a, uh, my first publishing experiment, which was a little pamphlet I put together that was meant as a joke. It was like a, a spoof, you know? Except I kept, I kept finding people who wanted to take it seriously. And I, I never can understand that when people don't... Well, you know, these days it's hard to have a sense of humor. But you have to have a sense of humor or you're going to go insane. Uh, Maybe we need to teach the president some jokes, you know? A priest, a rabbi, no. And a good looking woman walking to a bar, yeah. Yeah, um, okay, so it's called Fear of the Pen. And uh, it goes like this. When I was younger and wilder in certain ways, I fancied myself an authority on the process. It was one of those user-friendly expressions coined by the humanist school of psychology, the self-help introspective native intelligence gang. The process is how one lives the way one functions and reacts, in, and in understanding the process, one learned that life is a fluid, evolving, transient proposition, not a task to be completed, cataloged, but a procession of experiences linked together by one's particular twist of the DNA ladder, interfacing with the world. The process also meant coming to grips with one's place in one's time, owning one's impact. It's not fashionable nowadays in this world, obsessed with excuses and assigning blame. Now, you've got to remember, this, this was written in, most of this was written in 1984, so. Oddly, it still rings true. Uh, Exchange with all exciting blame. Sorry, I tend to talk when I'm turning the pages. With denials of responsibility, with political correctness, with the individual, with blind allegiance to God, country, MTV. <laughs> I thought I was in the driver's seat, controlling destiny, armed with the knowledge of the process. Part of knowing the process was the journal in which I recorded my thoughts, observations, occasional moments of insight, lucid thought, but mostly the journal became part of the con. I explored the con every angle, every scenario, realizing at last that ultimately I was scum. Believing that I was protected from the stain of scum and scummy actions because I thought I knew myself. I wrote myself into a cul-de-sac, keeping accurate notes of the fall from grace, spanning three years, filling three journals. I dropped like Icarus, hitting the ground with the force of a plummeting jetliner, scattering my possessions for miles. Friends fell away, scurrying for cover. Lovers lost interest, forsaken, forgotten by family. The things I valued, now clutter, broken and abandoned. I clung to scattered pages of my journals, hoping to insulate myself from the cold, hard reality of the crater I now called home. Some of the comfort, the words, thoughts, delusions, began to cling to me like shrink wrap, crushing me like a dying sun, collapsing in on himself. The tighter the squeezing, the more I believed I was betrayed by my friends, my family, my lovers, a very long list negated by the realization that the biggest betrayer of all was me. Oh, the humanity. Oh, the shame. The craven denial for weakness. It's now 34 years later. I'm still struggling to live with my self-betrayal, my scummy side, my imperfections, the odd notoriety, my haters, my lovers, no longer a journalist, I have found solace in the written word, the wonder of insight found in a simple broken phrase, the power of using a mental image to shine a light on 
grace or degradation, to illuminate the mysteries of the process. I still distrust my ability to chronicle the process. To some degree, I feel that I still fear the, the pen, but I have learned that like the sword, it's the mind that directs the hand as to how it will be used. This is my, uh, this is my speech outline. I didn't get very far before my computer killed itself. I hope it wasn't because of what I was writing, but you never know, you know? Um, so I'll just read this and we can go from there. I deal in words. My outfit is called Lumix Press and I've been doing this for 24 years. The first 20, it was a hobby, a hobby that paid for itself and gave me some pocket money, which is nice, you know, when you're can't get anything. It's nice to have a dollar or two in your pocket so you feel like you're still a man, you know, still out there doing the thing, working the deal, the real deal. Um, the remaining four years of it, that'd be the last four years, uh, it has become a small business and one that generates enough income to cover half of my monthly budget which may sound really good, but bear in mind, I live on a shoestring, so it's, it doesn't have to cover very much, but it does have to cover something, and, and the fact that I'm able to sell poetry to make a living stymies a lot of people I know because the popular belief is that there's no money in poetry, there's no money in self-publishing, and there's no money in uh, doing like an anthology kind of thing, but that's not true. It just, if you're willing to give it the work, because it's work, um, you can succeed. But if you're not willing to, if you're not in it for the long haul, then yeah, you're right. You won't make any money and you'll be, end up bitter and, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, I love that Long Beach air. <coughs> By the way, I'm not from Long Beach. I was born in Indiana and, uh, and I live, but I've lived in Long Beach as of next month, this will be my 20th year in Long Beach. That's longer than I've ever lived in any town in my entire life. So I guess I'm here. I mean, I'm a Long Beach native now, I guess. I mean, nobody built, none of my family members built a building here. And, you know, I, I remember one time Steve and I were driving to the library, I think it was, that he was going to help me do some research on getting a grant, but all it did was intimidate the hell out of me and it made me just want to retreat further into my shell. But we were driving down the street in his, in his convertible, which is a treat if you're not used to driving in a convertible, and he says, look at that building. And I went, what about the building? And he goes, my grandfather built that. I'm like, you're kidding. He goes, no, let's stop and just look at it, okay. Wow, that's incredible. So anyway, sideline. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, why poetry? That's the, um, the question that uh, Steve asked me to concentrate on. People ask me this question all the time. Many are incredulous that I can make a modest living at it. And, uh, but it is a hard sell. It really is a hard sell. I, I sell my books like this. I sell them one at a time. I've got copies of the, uh, the Lummox Journal, the Lummox Anthology, here at Made, And I'm going to pitch the hell out of that because I want you to buy all the copies. There's only five of them. It's not like it's going to kill you or anything. But, you know, the, the buying frenzy aspect of any Lummox Productions uh, presentation is the vaulted... Uh, buying frenzy portion of the program, which comes later, but, you know, we'll see what happens tonight. I'm not used to having to follow other people, so we don't know. Um, by the time of the night's over, you guys may be just like, oh, can we go? Are we there yet? Um, okay, so we've established that uh, people don't think it's possible to make a living selling poetry. And then you have the people who say that poetry is too hard to read. The modern stuff, the free verse stuff, like the poem that I just read. Um, it's 
they didn't understand how it works. You know, my mom writes poetry. She writes rhyming poetry. I tell her she should send me some poems and I could maybe put one in my book. And she's like, yeah, I write rhyming poetry. You don't like that. I'm like, I, no, I, 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 got, I don't have a problem with rhyming poetry as long as it's, you know, the right way. I mean, if it's like you're rhyming shun for 35 uh, lines, then that, that might be pushing the envelope a bit much. But, you know, rhyming poetry is fine. I don't write rhyming poetry. I wish I did. I'd probably be able to recite poetry and make you all think, wow, he's really got it going on. He's the real deal. Sorry, Steve, I'm going to be harping on that one for the rest of the evening. Um, so, uh-oh. That's quick. OK, I've just been given the hook. <laughs> Well, let's just say that uh, it's been an interesting process, and um, I, it's not something I would recommend that you get involved with unless you're not in it for the long haul. Although if you're writing poetry, you should definitely get in it. And uh, if you want to find out about my uh, anthology, um, I would be happy to talk to anybody who would like to submit work to me. Hint, hint. And. Um, I hope that you will be able to uh, have it, enjoy the rest of the night. And uh, I want to thank Maid and Steve for hooking this up and, and inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you.